have here at Gavi. Um, so we'd like to share uh, with you our journey uh, of using deep convolutional neural nets uh, and transfer learning techniques uh, to solve image quality problem at Allegro. And um, topic begins. Thanks. Okay, I'd like to start with introducing some context about us. So Allegro is the biggest um, e-commerce platform in Central and Eastern Europe with uh, over 8 million active offers and 40 uh, million users monthly. We are like the, the first uh, most popular published online shopping destination. Um, we all would like to use a platform that, that looks nice and clean. We know that the image quality, the product image quality affects the way our platform is perceived and it affects customer experience. And therefore, we, being a platform, we don't upload and create the images by ourselves. We rely on our sellers. And so we cannot change them. We can impose some rules on them. And we would like our images to be clean. And by that, we mean that the product is presented on a clean white background, that there is no additional text watermark, and that there is no frames on the product. So having a lot of searches every day, and most of them going through the default algorithm of relevancy, we can use this as a tool, as a kind of incentive for sellers to produce content of high quality. And what we are going to do in this project is to detect those aspects and use the relevance sorting as a tool to promote high quality images. So this is an example of the images that we would like to have, that we wish uh, to present at our platform. And here we have a few, one example of an image with each bad trait, so to say. So on the left, we see a product that is presented on some non-clear, non non-white background. In the middle, we have products surrounded with some text and there is a watermark, small here. And on the right, we have a product surrounded by a frame. So that's our scope. We want to detect those, those traits. Okay, let's proceed with the first solution that we tried on our journey here, which was to use a classical computer vision based algorithm. And I'm not going to go very deep into those, just as a reference. So, at that moment, we used a combination of a few algorithms, and by that, we used GrabCut for segmentation, which is a process of finding out which pixels on the image do refer to the product, the main, main thing itself. And then we averaged background brightness to detect background. Um, we used tiny edge detector for finding edges that we approximated to the frames, and we use a uh, maximally stable extreme regions, extreme other regions, for detecting text. It was combined with a bit of expert knowledge, and as you can imagine, after a while, it occurred to be quite hard to manually tune some hyperparameters there and combine those algorithms together. So we decided to go on for a machine learning solution. And our initial approach was to uh, tackle the frame aspect. And we trained a three layered convolutional neural net to detect those. And since our original data set had only 5,000 samples, 5,000 images, it's quite small for a, for, for a network like this, we had to use um, regularization techniques like image augmentation and dropout to to train this model. Okay, to train a model for a classification task like this, we need a labeled data set, right? So we need an image, and with each image we need a tag or a class that we want to predict for it. And any publicly available data set will not cover that kind of task, so we needed to create a sample by ourselves from, from our or distribution of all the images, so to say. So, first of all, we followed an active learning approach where we used the previous version of the classifier to like, prepare, 
groups of images, and the human task was just to pick those that were errors. It's, it's, much, it's a much easier task than to go through an unsorted list of images and pick a class for each. With that method, we, we gathered this data set of, of size 5,000. We found out that the data set of this size was too small for two reasons. First of all, it didn't represent the overall diversity that is on our platform with 80 million active offers. There is a bit of, um, there's a lot of different patterns and products that can be there. And secondly, it's, it's, a, it's not big enough to train an end to end model to detect all three aspects here. So we decided to outsource this problem to an external company called Diplomatic. We prepared a sample of images and they gave us a binary annotation for each tag, for each image here. Okay. Um, one side note for building a data set like this in the, uh, in the industry, we tried to tackle a few biases. By that I mean that we have a diverse product category. Some of them are very big, some are very small, and we don't want an overrepresentation of those big categories, as well as we don't want an overrepresentation of a single single set if it has lots of images and they all look alike. We don't need that kind of repetition, and we are mostly interested in popular offers. So we sampled 80% of the data set from the most popular offers, and the 20% were sampled randomly from the rest, uh, taking into account those, those biases, that we will only take maximum number of one image from each category and from each cell. Um, okay, one interesting thing is that we agreed that the error rate was to be maximum 1% and it was like this. And at the end of the project, our best performing model was actually able to find existing errors in this data set because it predicted it totally different class. So we were able to fix them as well at the end. The last um, thing about the data set I want to show you is that it was highly imbalanced. So in every aspect, especially on the right of the frame aspect, you see that only 10% of the images at frame are, are non compliant with the rules. So we will take that into account at the later stages when training the model. Okay, let's move on to a deep convolutional neural networks that we applied for the job because this looked like a tool, tool for our task. Oops. Okay, why neural nets at the beginning? So, neural nets, as you probably know, are can approximate almost any function provided they have proper size and structure. Um, they are built quite easily. It's a series of linear transformation interleaved with nonlinear activation functions. And we can train them very well using um, algorithms. Um, we use back propagation here for multilayer perceptrons, which is a, a specific case of uh, stochastic gradient descent SG. And until, up until a few years ago, it was quite hard to train big and large models like this um, due to a few problems. And recently, the progress in research in this area went quite fast, and it is now it is now possible to effectively train a uh, very accurate model. And convolutional neural networks are this, this type of network that is is used for handling data like images, data that have local structure. And by local structure, I mean that if you want to say whether on this image you see a cat or something else, and if you represent an image as a matrix of triplets of numbers, one for each color in RGB space, then you look at nearby pixels, not at pixels that are very distant from each other. And Convolutional filters, which are building block of convolutional networks, exploit this property. So a filter is a function built in three dimensions that goes through an image and for each part of the image it generates an activation value that is then an input for the next line. So we have many filters like this, each detects a distinct feature. And what's most important is that one filter is applied in the same way for every part of the image. 
and this is called parameter sharding in general. Here you can see an example of visualization of input layer, first layer composition of filters from Alex Network. And you can see that on the top, in the top row, those uh, filters would activate on specifically on edges, both thick and thin, and at various rotation angles. At the bottom, the filters are mostly sensitive to uh, color, mm, neighboring different colors. So these are kind of the basic features, basic visual features that those kind of networks are capable of, of finding out and detecting. And here we can see a structure, overall structure of, of a convolutional neural net, where from the left, a power and input image goes in, it goes through a series of convolutional layers, each one has uh, a convolutional filter. They are interleaved with subsampling, also called pooling operations, which uh, aim, whose aim is to, first of all, reduce the dimensionality of the data, and second of all, to make the um, network, um, make the network ignore the actual location of, of a specific uh, trait. At the end of the convolutional layer, we have a vector to be called an embedding vector. This is kind of a representation of the whole image. And depending on our task, we can do something with it here. It goes through a fully connected uh, network for a classification task at the end. So a networks like this started to, um, to work very well. I would like to show you how it happened that deep convolutional neural nets actually are able to beat human or better than human on some tasks. And here I the return of stage six. All right, so um, it's hard to talk about um, recent advancements in convolutional uh, neural nets without mentioning uh, computation. Uh, where all those networks were uh, submitted, and that's uh, ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, or ILSVRC for short. That's uh, probably the most prestigious and, uh, and most important um, competition for image recognition and for object detection tasks. Um, and at the core of this competition, there's a data set which consists of probably uh, 1.2 million um, images, which uh, have some um, Quite high variability um, in them, so you can see you can see um, there's um, plenty of different aspects, but uh, plenty of different aspects uh, that those images show. So there's some problem with the microphone. All right, is it better now? Yeah. Yeah. All right, good. Uh, so um, we can see that there are some images of different scale. Um, some images are cluttered or not. Uh, as some objects are deformed, uh, we can see that uh, the uh, items in the real world might be of different size. Um, so it basically, uh, it's a good data set that shows uh, what we see in our lives. Uh, here we can see uh, how uh, convolutional, uh, convolu uh, convolutional uh, neural net um, could handle uh, classification of those images. And what's important is that there's um, a thousand classes in there. So, so uh, those tests are quite specific. Um, there are two uh, kinds of metrics that are used uh, to assess how, how well those, uh, those convolutional, uh, convolutional neural nets or how those models uh, perform. And this is uh, the top one metric where uh, we expect that the, uh, the top hypothesis uh, of a model is the right one. Or uh, there's top five where we expect that uh, the right one is in the top five uh, guesses of the network. Uh, so at the top, we can see uh, that there are uh, some images that were um, um, classified correctly uh, by this um, means of top one metric. So we can see a mite in there that was uh, a bit off the center, and the network uh, managed to, uh, to recognize it correctly. We can see a motor scooter, uh, which was uh, photographed in really bad uh, lighting conditions, uh, so the network managed to uh, recognize as well. Uh, we can see some other images that we would probably have uh, some trouble recognizing them as well uh, because of, uh, of how uh, ambiguous the class is. And we also have some uh, some images uh, that um, 
Well, uh, we could argue whether uh, the picture here is a, a dog or a cherry, uh, and probably none of us would uh, recognize Madagascar cat, I guess. Um, so um, um, we can look um, uh, at some at some other insights from um, from paper describing uh, Alex, which was mentioned uh, by Thomas previously. Um, so um, in here we see uh, at the leftmost column uh, we see some reference images which were processed by the network, and we uh, looked at uh, the vectors that represented high-level features uh, of those images. So we want to see how well uh, the network learns those high-level features. Um, and then we um, looked at uh, vectors created for other images in a data set and looked for the linear response. And those are those images. So uh, we queried with the one uh, in the leftmost column and then we looked for the closed ones. But we can see that semantically uh, those images match. Uh, that um, well, um, confirms that um, those high-level features that are being recognized by the network uh, are actually accessible ones. Right, we can also see that uh, image that uh, data set contains a really uh, diverse set of classes, and those classes are pretty specific. If we compare it to Pascal Bock, which is the um, competition that was held before uh, image that, uh, there were classes like bird or cat or dog. Now we have different kinds of schnauz, different breeds, so that's really specific. All right, so, uh, so here's the uh, network that I was talking um, about previously, um, and that's a pretty, pretty important one. Uh, that's by Alex Krzyzewski, Ilya Sotskiewa, and Jeff Hinton from 2012. Before 2012, not many researchers were interested in CNNs or state-of-the-art solutions uh, in image recognition, and it was uh, mostly due to the fact that um, those architectures were blocked by some issues like store convergence, gradient uh, vanishing, uh, or the tendency to overfit, and um, there were other models that performed simply better, like SVMs with um, carefully crafted engineered uh, feature extractors like Seed or Hog. Um, so um, it all changed in, um, in 2012 uh, where um, Alex Pichewski submitted his model uh, to ImageNet competition and he reached um, I'm not sure, and I guess I don't have the numbers in front of me, but he reached roughly 15% uh, of top 5 error rate compared to 26, um, which is the second best entry, um, uh, which uh, uses assemble uh, techniques uh, based on, on, on SIP and feature vectors. Um, all right, so it all sparked a, uh, a huge boom in research on CNNs. Uh, this is the VGG net uh, from 2014, and we can see uh, that. Um, the network got deeper, and what's really interesting about this network is that it kept really simple structure. So there were uh, plain field tests that were just three by three, um, and um, there were um, same layers one after another. Um, and this structure occurred to, to uh, work really, really well. Um, it didn't win um, image classification, uh, it was second. Uh, but it won uh, object detection task in 2014, and it's still used uh, by many researchers as base for uh, for some other research or some other more models. And here we can see uh, the architecture of Inception V3 uh, network from uh, 2016, and we can see that the network got even deeper. Uh, there are some um, some new interesting ideas like those uh, repeatable cells, which are, uh, were called Inception cells. Um, which could be scaled so we can um, add more, so uh, add more cells like like that after uh, one another and increase the depth and then check whether it works better or not. Also, uh, there were some ideas like like one by one convolutions, um, which were uh, like on bypass. So um, then, when concatenated, um, it uh, it made for a faster convergence. Um, it's some sort of similar to residual connections. All right, so uh, in here we, we see um, a graph by, uh, by Adam Paschke from Warsaw, and you can see how, uh, uh, how well those, those networks perform right now. So Alexnet from 2012 is in here. So we've made a massive progress in recent years. And that's the, the right moment to, to mention Andre Kapadi and his experiment about learning uh, classes from ImageNet. Uh, from ImageNet. Uh, so he uh, basically uh, trained himself on the training set 
um, then uh, tested himself and cured that he reached a uh, top 5 error of uh, 5.1, um, if I recall correctly, uh, which, is, uh, which is higher than the current state of the art. Uh, like in recent networks, easily reach uh, around 3% of top 5 error. All right, so um, yeah, I'll mess it up. Sorry. Yeah. I want to start to use this one. All right, so how did this happen? Uh, uh, there's plenty of techniques that, that actually uh, make these um, big improvements in, in deep learning, um, but um, not all of them are so well understood. Uh, it was argued uh, by Ali Rahimi uh, at age 2017, where he uh, had a pretty influential speech of his test of time award. Uh, he argued that uh, currently not all of uh, the techniques that we use in deep learning are well understood and have a strong theoretical basis, um, uh, which, uh, which then he mentioned in a pretty, a pretty significant uh, sentence, which I'm going to quote. Uh, he said, uh, we are applying brutal optimization techniques to those surfaces we do not understand. And that's probably true. Uh, but not all techniques are so uh, misunderstood or, or, or not, or not uh, well grounded theoretically. Um, so um, if we think about um, what makes deep learning work right now, then besides uh, massive data sets and uh, a huge increase in computational power um, due to the use of general purpose GPU computing, um, we also had pre-training using deep, deep elite nets, which is uh, quite big, like a decade ago. Uh, we have Dropbox, which is a new regularizer. Uh, we have new techniques of image augmentation. Uh, we also have uh, rectified linear units, or ReLU, uh, activation function, uh, which is featured on right, uh, which solves, or at least fights, uh, vanishing gradients. We have much normalization, which is a technique that speeds up trains significantly and uh, it makes for better results in the end. Uh, we also have smart initializers like Glorio and HAM. Uh, we have residual connections which made a big difference uh, for CNNs. And in the end, uh, it appears that HGB has some strange properties that make it converge really, really well uh, and is being researched uh, in the recent years. All right, so uh, how did we apply all of that to uh, our problem at Allegro? Uh, so, um, we can talk about it before mentioning transfer learning. Uh, transfer learning, as uh, shown by Rosarian et al. Uh, in his paper, CNN features off the shelf and astounding baseline for recognition. It occurs that, that CNNs are then really, really good representations uh, that uh, are very generic. Um, we might say that they are robust. Uh, by that, we mean that if we uh, have those representations and we know how how to extract this information uh, from um, from the data? Then we can apply the same the same feature extractors in different domains. So uh, if we have some pre-trained model and uh, we want to retrain it to different domains, different tasks, taking advantage of uh, all the knowledge that we gain, then that's cross learning. Um, that's currently the way to go uh, when it comes to image recognition and object detection tasks, especially if we have uh, small data sets. All right, so uh, here's a quote from uh, Deep Learning Group by Ian Gufalo. Uh, he basically uh, called transfer learning uh, like that. Um, transfer learning and domain adaptation refer to the situation where what has been learned in one setting is exploited to improve generalization in another setting. All right, so um, we use transfer learning, um, but uh, uh, to make it work, uh, we had to construct our own model. So. Um, the crucial component is the base network, which is a pre-trained image net uh, complex. Then, inside of this network, uh, the network we look for a uh, embedding vector or embedding layer from which uh, we will read the activations. Uh, that will be um, a base for our classifier. Uh, so, on top of this embedding layer, we uh, apply our classifier, which might be just a plain linear regression or it might be something a bit more elaborate, like um, multi-layer version from. Um, at the end of this network, 
we uh, had single neural neurons, uh, three of them actually, uh, one for each aspect, uh, which score uh, the presence of some undesirable traits, uh, by scores from zero up to one, when, where one means that uh, uh, some, some, some clues that are uh, images incorrect uh, have been uh, noticed in the, in the picture. Uh, when it comes to training, we use, um, we use cross entropy uh, for those sigmoids and then we average them so that we can train our model simultaneously. Um, also, uh, we, uh, we are aware that our data set is imbalanced, uh, so we weight uh, the loss for the positive class uh, so that we can keep our scores centered uh, and, and quite comparable to each other. So here's a big picture. When you look in this part of the image, this, uh, these are screenshots from uh, from TensorFlow. Uh, so that's the base concept. In here, that's that's VGG16. On top of that, we have a classifier, and both of those components are getting optimized by the optimizer. If we look how we plugged into the base concept, then uh, we can see that there are some convolutional layers. That's that's VGG16. Obviously, underneath here, there's there's plenty of more. Uh, of those, of those uh, convolutional layers, but at the end of the last convolutional module, uh, we plug in um, our classifier uh, so uh, so that we don't use all of those all of those uh, ways that we use to classify for image classes. Uh, if we look how our classifier is built, uh, then based on the activations from the embedding layer, uh, we might apply some drop-up to that if we find it um, appropriate. If we test that, that that's a good idea. Um, then we have some fully connected layers, and in the end we have an output layer. Alright, so um, this is the structure of a fully connected layer, uh, where we, uh, we have some activations from the previous layer, and then we multiply that by weights, we add some biases, we might add some uh, batch normalization if that's necessary, if that's how we configured our experiment, uh, and then we apply our activation function, which in our case is red. Uh, and on top of that, we might apply drop on also if that's how the <coughs> experiment was configured. All right, so that's the last layer, that's the output layer, when also we have activations from the previous layer, uh, then we multiply that by weights, add some biases, apply a patch form, and in the end we have three sigmoidal neurons that are responsible for uh, recognizing aspects that were mentioned previously. All right, so now that's the time to talk about the metrics that we use. Um, uh, we are doing um, binary classification, therefore we focus mainly on, um, on binary classification metrics. And obviously we look at the cross-entropy uh, cross um, loss, um, by the means that we look at the cross-entropy loss uh, aspects specifically, so uh, for each aspect in individually, and also uh, we look at, uh, at the mean of them, so like uh, holistically, I'd say. Um, then uh, we also had a look on the area and the uh, ROC curve. Uh, we look we looked also um, at the precision and recall metrics at different thresholds, uh, and that was aspect specific. We also look at the uh, true positive rate, false positive rate true negative rate and false negative rate at different thresholds. And we also chose our main metric, and uh, the main metric that we used uh, was the mean area and the ROC uh, curves for each aspect. And uh, that was our main metric, or the most important metric, which we used to distinguish which model works better or not. Uh, and on that, a bit, uh, a bit more later. Mm -hmm. All right, so how did we gather those, uh, those metrics? We used um, TensorFlow to create our model. And TensorFlow comes with a tool called TensorBot, uh, which is quite handy. That's, that's a good visualization tool. Um, so uh, we were able to track our metrics in real time as we train our models. Uh, TensorFlow comes with a um, bunch of, um, of predefined metrics, metric operations, uh, which we could use. Uh, but we, are not, we were not constrained to them because uh, we could simply define our own metrics just by playing operations, by playing average metrics uh, defined inside the computation graph. Uh, also, we heavily depended on the streaming mode in, in TensorFlow, uh, which allows us to, uh, to minimize the variance of uh, the metrics that we, that we collect. 
because um, obviously when we do uh, stochastic gradient descent, um, all of those metrics and gradients and everything is just an estimate. Uh, and we wanted to re reduce uh, variance so that we could uh, actually rely, rely on the metrics uh, that we look at. Uh, therefore, we basically uh, made TensorFlow um, to calculate those metrics over several batches, actually 32 if I recall correctly, um, so that we, we had a pretty low variance. Right, and here we can see um, some metrics that were collected uh, in a uh, by threshold manner. So we have several series, and that's actually uh, a precision uh, for watermarks for text. And uh, we can see that uh, there's, there's plenty of series in, in here, and you might wonder why, why, why did we actually collect that if um, area on the ROC is, uh, is the most important for us? It actually occurred that area on the ROC um, represented well all of those, those metrics that were important for, uh, for our business, for our non technical people. Um, so when we're talking to them, we obviously need to talk about. Uh, metrics that were basically uh, understandable, comprehensible by them. And that was definitely not the area on the ROC curve. Um, so yes, that's, that's, that's why we, we track that as well. Uh, all right, so now it's time to talk about the uh, hyperparameters. Um, obviously, we tuned them. Uh, so what are hyperparameters? Uh, hyperparameters are all those parameters that define model properties, like the network topology. And also all the parameters that define how optimization process is, um, is being done. Uh, so uh, let's say learning rate as well. All right. Um, it's really important to tune those parameters because uh, there's plenty of them, and it's really hard to choose correct ones uh, in the beginning. Um, and, th and thankfully, uh, we have some tools uh, that help with that, like uh, hyperparameter. Optimizers, uh, which might be just plain research, it might be some random search, it might be something uh, a bit more fancy, like Google Vizier. Uh, but still, human expertise is, is crucial, it's necessary, because we found that um, it's really hard to iterate and to try some different designs, because then we, uh, we might just uh, omit some, some really nice, interesting models, uh, simply because we didn't choose sensible hyperparameters uh, to tune them in the first place. Right, so that's the list of hyperparameters that we tuned. Uh, that was um, the heat rate for dropout at, uh, on top of a main layer. Uh, obviously, we tuned uh, learning rate and we decayed it. So we also needed to tune the exponential decay rate and exponential decay stuff. Uh, we also applied L2 regularization uh, called also weight decay, which was decayed as well. Uh, we fine tuned the base component after a certain uh, number of, of batches, which was crucial to achieve the performance that we actually achieved. But we couldn't do it from the beginning, otherwise we would break, break the, uh, the base component. So, uh, so we also tuned when to start fine tuning. Um, we uh, also fine tuned uh, or tuned um, hyperparameter, that was the choice of, uh, of the optimizer. And uh, we change whether to use parse norm or not. Uh, well, because obviously the parse norm will, will make better results. We just want to play with that. Um, all right, for MLP classifiers, we also uh, tuned uh, classifier topology and drop out key rates for uh, classifier layers. Um, so in here, we can see a single run of hyperparameter optimizer. And uh, in there, we can see a Syria uh, per, per model. As you can see, there's plenty, plenty of uh, of those series on the spot, and um, it's really hard to stress enough how important it is to have a metric that you can rely on, and as you know, that it fully represents what business needs from you. Because otherwise, we would look at different metrics like false positive rates, uh, true positive rates, false negative rates, blah blah blah, and, and it would be really, really hard to to choose the best model from all of those. Uh, but we knew that the mean um, area on the rock is just, just like the right metric for us. So that's why we use this, this one. Otherwise, we will not be able to choose the right model. All right, so um, now it's time to talk about the experience we gained. First of all, uh, 
well, those are the best practices that we had. Uh, first of all, it's really important to know uh, the algorithm that you use. Uh, if, you, uh, if you use Dropout or if you use Python, you better know what you're doing and how it works, because otherwise, if something breaks, you'll be wondering uh, what went wrong. And knowing that uh, will at least a bit assure you that you're doing the right thing. Uh, if you're doing trunks learning, uh, you also better know the architecture of the network that you use. Uh, so you better read the paper about that. Um, it's not so important to create beautiful code when you are modeling, but then on the other hand, um, if you, if you um, craft your code correctly, architect it correctly, so it's worth working up, then you might iterate over, over different designs and, and experiments um, quite, uh, quite quickly. Um, as I said before, it's really important to have a single, a single number metric that tells whether a model is better or not. Um, if there's one good thing that you might apply to regular, regularize uh, uh, your training, that's that augmentation for images, definitely, that works the best. Um, also, uh, when doing fine tuning uh, in transfer learning, it helps out, definitely. Uh, but then um, it's very really easy to wreck the carefully tuned weights in your base complex or any other network. Uh, and therefore, it's really important to, uh, to keep in mind that, that while your classifier uh, is randomly initialized, uh, backpropagating those, gra those gradients won't help at all. Uh, so it's, it's a good idea to first tune your classifier, then start tuning your, your base complex, and always choose wise optimization parameters, so wise learning rate, because otherwise it will, it will ruin uh, that complex as well. It's a good idea to use Python by default, it just works. Uh, if you are using Python, it's usually not needed to use Dropout, because uh, Python is uh, working as a regularizer as well. Um, it might seem that 20k is not the best right now, because we have other techniques, but um, it seems that it, it, work, it helps HD uh, to convert to better minima. Therefore, it's a good idea to, um, to use that as well. Uh, you should definitely use some uh, wise parameter initialization. Uh, it's good to decay your learning rate. That's, that's pretty obvious. And it's always uh, good to tune your hyperparameters. Uh, right, so uh, right now, uh, it's time to talk about how we uh, deploy this model to production. And I'm uh, going to talk about that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. okay. Uh, having a model that um, gives good enough, good enough performers, good enough uh, metrics, we deploy it to production. This is our deployment architecture diagram. So the model is deployed inside the TensorFlow serving uh, service, which is um, called by the streaming component that is triggered whenever a new image uh, occurs on the platform, it's uploaded. The images are aggregated and, and uploaded to our search engine, uh, where in an oversimplification, uh, scores are aggregated and used to boost uh, images that have uh, offers that have compliant images. And this is a timeline of um, adoption of kind of good practice by our sellers. So, on the y-axis, we have percent of images on our platform that have perfect scores, so they, they, they do not have any unwanted trade. And during the last year and, uh, and a bit, it's it boomed from a bit more than 50% to almost 90%. So it means that uh, this this approach works. Okay, a summary. We showed that. Deep convolutional neural networks are the tool for those kind of job. Uh, if you have your own problem with images or your own challenge, then transfer learning is the method you would like to go with. Um, they are applicable at scale, we are production ready. And to summarize, so with deep learning and machine learning, we solve the issue of, of, bad, of images with bad quality. And if you are passionate about things like this and are interested in solving them, 
We are currently hiring for research engineer for our team here at Krakow in Warsaw. So let us give us a call. And thanks very much, and we are open for questions. use so we use like pretty general complaint techniques like uh, 